Hello, and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm your host, Neil Trotter, and today, in this video, we're going to be talking about abolitionism. And we're not specifically talking about old school abolitionism, you know, uh, pre-Civil War days when American slavery was legal and de facto and accepted by mainstream society. Right? And you know, the whole movement that was against slavery when that movement was not popular. Right? You had the people fighting for that, you know, Quakers, Frederick Douglass, people of that nature. Um, no, what we're talking about is modern contemporary abolitionism, where the movement is today. Right? And today, the movement is focused on abolishing police and prisons and also surveillance. And we're going to do that via a discussion of this text right here. It's called, We Do This Till We Free Us by Mariam Kaba. And if you check out the subtitle, it's Abolitionist Organizing and Transforming Justice. Mm -hmm. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, you might think to yourself, well, you know, I've heard about this idea uh, or you might be like, "Whoa, that's kind of crazy." <laughs> you know, it might be very. You might dismiss it outright, right? It's a very common re reaction. Uh, we need police, right? Who's going to take care of the bad guys, the evildoers, the, the morally corrupt people? We need prisons. Where are you going to lock up those those really harsh people that you know? There's really no hope for them, or uh, you know, they're just really just uncontrollable or they're just kind of far gone in terms of their ethics or morals and um, you know you just gotta lock them up you know what we need some sort of mechanism what if a, a, a horrendous or you know very horrible incident or accident happens uh, in terms of crime and we need somebody to address that issue and you can't just have nobody you, you, then you're gonna have the wild west right you know a common reaction you know, a common response is all oh, people who are into abolition or abolitionism, you know, uh, abolishing the police, even defunding the police. That's very naive. That's very um, hippy dippy almost like, you know, it's people who are into kumbaya and uh, they don't really know how the world works and they don't really understand human nature. You know, some people just you have to have that kind of mechanism to control people. Right. Uh, well, I would argue that that you know, think of it, thinking of it like that, you know, what I've been saying, <laughs> right? The uh, that mentality of uh, we need police, we need prisons. That's quite naive. That's quite um, surface level thinking. You know, I would argue like you're really not thinking about the each situation that is crime, that is justice. You're not really thinking about it in depth. You're being dismissive about it. If you really think about it and you know, what prisons actually do and what have they done in their historical status in America specifically, but even in the world, right? And police, what the police actually accomplish, uh, you know, the statistics of what the police do, uh, you'll see like they don't, or they don't really solve the problem of crime and prisons don't really deal with the need for justice. And then some people might respond like, well, what we need to do is like heavily reform, right? We need to really radically change um, prisons and the prison uh, system and criminal justice system. That one needs to happen, but you can't just get rid of it all out. Well, if you look at prisons and police as a system, and the system is not working or it's working as designed, but is that system actually working to solve the problem of crime or the need to deliver justice, right? Or has that system been set up originally <laughs> to do other things, right? And if that's the case, then uh, maybe we need a new system and get rid of the system that we have. These are things that we're going to talk about today. It's all about philosophical discussion, right? Uh, 
Abolitionism is more than philosophy, right? It's a movement. It's action. It's getting involved. It's organizing. It's activism. It's all of those things. But it's also a philosophy. We're going to focus on that. So what is abolitionism in the modern day? Well, we're going to read some quotes from this book. As we do here in the Black Ponder, we read quotes from the text. And then we add supplementary commentary. Oh, well, I add supplementary commentary. Then we continue the discussion on the comments below. So I'm going to read you this quote about defining what abolitionism is today. This is from page two. This is the third paragraph. Okay. Prison industrial complex abolition is a political vision, a structural analysis of oppression, and a practical organizing strategy. While some people might think of abolition as primarily a negative project, quote, let's tear everything down tomorrow and hope for the best, mm -mm. end quote. Uh, prison industrial complex abolition is a vision of restructured society in a world where we have everything we need, food, shelter, education, health, art, beauty, clean water, and more things that are foundational to our personal and community safety. Every vision is also a map, as freedom fighter Kwame Tour or Toure, excuse my mispronunciation there, taught us, when you see people call themselves revolutionary, always talking about destroying, 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 but never talking about building or creating, they're not revolutionary. Okay, these are, these are key ideas. Okay. But I'll continue. They do not understand the first thing about revolution. It's creating. Revolution is creating. It's not just destroying. <laughs> destroying is destroying. Revolution is destroying what doesn't work and creating something new that does. Let's continue. Prison industrial complex abolition is a positive project that focuses in part on building a society where it is possible to address harm without relying on structural forms of oppression or the violent systems that increase it. Some people may ask, does this mean that I can never call the cops if my life is in serious danger? Abolition does not center that question. That's, that's, we gotta talk about that too. Abolition does not center that question. Instead, abolition challenges us to ask, why do we have no other well-resourced options? And pushes us to creatively consider how we can grow, build, and try other avenues to reduce harm. Repeated attempts to improve the sole option offered by the state, despite how inconsistently corrupt and injur injurious it has proven itself, will neither reduce nor address the harm that actually required the call. We need more and effective options for the greatest number of people. Mm -hmm. Why is the police our only option? We can't do other things. That's just not something that we can even consider. But I continue, let me skip down one paragraph. An abolitionist journey ignites other questions capable of meaningful and transformative pathways. What work do prisons and police policing actually do? Most people assume that incarceration helps to reduce violence and crime thinking the criminal punishment system might be racist, sexist, classist, ableist, and unfair, but at least it keeps me safe from violence and crime. That's the other thing. Like, we know that the pris criminal punishment system, prisons, we know that they're racist. We know that they're sexist, classist, ableist, and unfair. We, we know they're like torture chambers. We know they're horrible places. And they're in unjust in many ways. This is not something new. But they, at least they keep us safe. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Facts and history tell us a different story. Increasing rates of incarceration have a minimal impact on crime rates. Research and common sense suggest that economic precarity is correlated with higher crime rates. Moreover, crime and harm are not synonymous. All that is criminalized isn't harmful and all harm isn't necessarily criminalized. We know this, like marijuana is a perfect example, <laughs> right? But there's many other examples. Oh, I'll, I'll continue. For example, wage theft by employers isn't generally criminal, criminalized, but it is definitely harmful. Mm -hmm. 
Let me skip down to the bottom of the page. Abolitionist politics and practice contend that disposing of people by locking them away in jails and prisons does nothing significant to prevent, reduce, or transform harm in the aggregate. It rarely, if ever, encourages people to take accountability for their actions. Instead, our adversarial court system discourages people from ever acknowledging, let alone taking responsibility, for the harm they have caused. And that's, that's justice, right? Uh, acknowledging and taking responsibility for the harm that they cause. That's justice. Now, do prisons do that? No. At the same time, it allows us to avoid our own responsibilities to hold each other accountable, instead delegating it into, to a third party, one that has been built to hide away social and political failures. It, prisons are a way to dismiss the, the harsh reality that prisons create. You know, we, we, I don't even think about it. <laughs> uh, you know, we just lock things away that I don't want to think about it. People who, you know, I don't want to think about it. I'm just going to put them in the box, in a cage, so I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> right? That's not philosophy. This is a philosophical channel. That's not justice, you know, furthermore. Uh, that's not ethical or moral, moral, is it? But, you know, we're a philosophy channel, so I'm focusing on the philosophical. We got to think about this. So... Let's add to the critical philosophical analysis of abolitionism. And I will do that by reading quote number two. This is on page 12. This is the last paragraph. History offers evidence of the intractability of the problem of police violence. I made several videos about the historical analysis and uh, you know statistical facts of what prisons actually do, how they really aren't effective at addressing crime. Check them out. Uh, the cards will be, you know, placed on the video. But let me continue. History offers evidence of the intractability of the problem of police violence. What should we do then? Quite simply, we must end the police. The hegemony of police is so complete that we often can't begin to imagine a world without the institution. Okay, that's a key. Uh, the hegemony of police is so complete that we often cannot begin to imagine a world without the institution. We have a brain, we have the mind, we can think. What would it be necessary? What would a world be like without police? An effective world. Like We can think this through. It's not, it's not naive to do this. We are too reliant on the police. In fact, the police increase their legitimacy through all of the, the non-police related work that they assume, including doing wellness and mental health checks. Why should armed people be deployed to do the work of community members and social workers? Why have we become so comfortable with ceding so much power to the police? Right. And we know police are overworked and they do things that they're not qualified to do. But, you know, the dismissive response is, well, yeah, that's just the system that we have. So it is what it is. Like, no, <laughs> that's a horrible response. Right. That's not problem solving. That's being naive. Right. But let's continue. This is page 13. And I begin on bullet point number eight. Building community-based interventions that address harms without relying on the police. This is what we need to be thinking about. And I'll go to bullet point number 10. Thinking through the end of the police and imagining alternatives. Alternatives, please. Let's think it, let's think about this. Okay. And we're gonna talk about that. And I, you know, I've also talked about that in previous videos. We must reject all talk about policing and the overall criminal punishment system being broken, quote unquote, or not working. By rhetorically constructing the criminal punishment system as broken, reform is reaffirmed and abolition is painted as unrealistic and unworkable. Those of us who maintain that reform is actually impossible within the current context are positioned as unreasonable and naive. Ideological formations often operate invisibly to delineate and define what is acceptable discourse. Challenges to dominant ideological formations about justice are met with anger, ridicule, or simply ignored. 
This is in the service of those who benefit from the current system and works to enforce white supremacy and anti-blackness. Hello, Black Ponder, you know I was gonna go there. Next page, third paragraph. There is not a single era in United States history in which the police were not a force of violence against black people. Policing in the South emerged from slave patrols in the 1700s and 1800s that caught and returned runaway slaves. In the North, the first municipal police departments in the mid-1800s helped squash labor strikes and riots against the rich. Everywhere, police have suppressed marginalized populations to, to protect the status quo. And it's important to talk about history because a lot of people say, well, that was in the past. That's not how it is today. But any intelligent person or, or you know, any historian will tell you right. that history influences the present. Right. To understand what where we are today, we have to understand where we were. What police started as and the history of police heavily influence, dictates even, how the police operate today. That's why you see today police murders of unarmed black people, right? Because that's how the police started and they carry that institution, that systemic uh, practices to this day, right? Because they're rooted in that system. That's why studying history is important. So when you see a police officer pressing his knee into a black man's neck until he dies, <laughs> I should just let the text speak for itself, but we're adding supplementary commentary. Anyway, that's the logical result of policing in America. When a police officer brutalizes a black person, he is doing what he sees as his job. I put in my notes here, the police have always been an institution of oppression. So how do you reform or you know heavily change an institution of oppression? You can't do it, right? Have you, or doing it is illogical. Right? You can do it, but it's illogical because at the end of the day, it's still going to be an institution of oppression. How do you reform oppression? <laughs> That's not effective. What you do is you eliminate oppression, right? You abolish oppression. But I'm going to skip to the top of page 15. We can't simply change their job descriptions to focus on the worst of the worst criminals. That's not what they are set up to do. Right. The, the very structure, the makeup of policing as a system does not allow for that to happen. Let me skip to the third paragraph, page 15. History is instructive, not because it offers us a blueprint for how to act in the present, but because it can help us ask better questions for the future. Page 16. The fifth paragraph. But don't get me wrong, the author, Kaba. <laughs> we, aren't, we are not abandoning our communities to violence. We don't want to just close police departments. That's not the only thing that abolitionists want to do. Okay, they want to do that, but also we want to make them obsolete. What does that mean? We should redirect the billions that now go to police departments toward providing health care, housing, education, and good jobs. If we did this, there would be less need for police in the first place. We can build other ways of responding to harms in our society. Trained community care workers could do mental health checks if someone needs help. Towns could use restorative justice models instead of throwing people in prisons. What about rape? The current approach hasn't ended it. In fact, most rapists never see the inside of a courtroom. Two thirds of people who experience sexual violence never report it to anyone. Those who file police reports are often dissatisfied with the response. Additionally, police officers themselves commit sexual assault alarmingly often. I skip down three lines. When people, especially white people, consider a world without the police, they envision a society as violent as our current one, merely without law enforcement, and they shudder. You know, that idea like, oh, it's going to be the Wild West. As a society, we have been so indoctrinated with the idea that we solve problems by policing and caging people that many cannot imagine anything other than prisons and the police as solutions to violence and harm. 
it's interesting because often when I talk to people um, and I say, you know, abolishing police, that's a good idea. And they're, they're like, yeah, you know, we should, we should police ourselves, <laughs> right? No, like the very concept of policing, not, not just police men or police women or police people, policing the institution, the system of policing, that's the problem. <laughs> that needs that we should not police ourselves. Instead, we need to like shift our minds, our frame of thinking. How do we deal with justice? How do we deal with crime? And what really is policing? What is policing? Let me continue. People like me, the author, who want to abolish prisons and police, however, have a vision of a different society built on cooperation instead of individualism, on mutual aid instead of self-preservation. Okay, this is exactly what I'm talking about. It's not about policing ourselves. It's about cooperation, mutual aid, uh, instead of individualism and self-preservation. We want a different society, not policing ourselves. We got to create a different kind of society. Okay. What would the country look like if it had billions of extra dollars to spend on housing, food, and ed education for all, instead of what? Policing and the military, <laughs> right? Instead of, we, of putting all that money into that, what if we put it instead in, you know, housing, food, education for all? Think about it, okay? I'm gonna go to page 20. This is the fourth line of the second paragraph. As a society, we have long turned away from any social concern that overwhelms us, whether it's war, climate change, or the prison industrial complex. Americans have been conditioned to simply look away from profound harms. We do that often. We're like, you know, something that's really complicated and difficult, even like a person. For example, when somebody says, you know, what about those really corrupt people, those really evil dudes, the people that are really just pop off and they're like really crazy. Those people you gotta lock up. <laughs> you know, what do we do with those people? Uh, the people who do very heinous acts, like really serial killers and that kind of thing. We look away with that. We're like, just lock up the serial killer. Instead of thinking like, how did, how did that serial killer come to be? Like what was the societal conditions that made that person become a, a you know that serial killer a serial rapist or you know whatever evil thing that you can conjure up like how did that what in society enabled that to happen but you know but then that forces us to look at ourselves as a society be like well actually the society created that the, that person didn't just develop those tendencies those evil moral aspects on their own and that's important to understand because that's how we get at the root of the problem. But let me continue. Years of this practice have now left us with endless wars, dying oceans, and millions of people in bondage and oppressively policed. It is time for a thorough, unflinching examination of what our society has wrought and what we have become. It is time to envision and create alternatives to hellish conditions our society has brought into being. Mm -hmm. It's the conditions of society that is the primary driver to people doing evil actions. And this is just individual moral decisions. There's a lot more to it than that. This is page 21, and this is the third paragraph. When we speak about the abolition of the prison industrial complex, many react as though the idea is alien and unthinkable, as if to them, prisons, policing, and surveillance are part of a natural order that simply cannot be undone. In truth, the prison system did not see its massive population surge until the 1980s, when industrialization created the need for dungeon economies to replace lost jobs and a backlash against the civil rights movement and other social gains by black people propelled heightened efforts at social control. As a society, we have been taught to to embrace social control, which is often enforced by people with guns, because we have been taught to fear each other and to acquiesce it to authority. We live in a culture that celebrates criminalization, cops, and prisons. Abusive, torturous police become sympathetic television characters whose harms the public can understand or even sympathize with. 
But when a civilian has committed an egregious harm, the national solace we are taught to seek is to see them suffer. They must be thrown in a cage. And once they are, justice is considered to be done and we can all move on with our lives without ever asking questions like, why did this happen? Why does it keep happening? And is there something we could change the, that would make this tragedy unthinkable in the first place? Thinking about these things philosophically. Mm -hmm. We don't do that, do we? <laughs> we do not. But this author and Mariam Kabe does and abolitionists do as well. We're on um, page 22. This is the third paragraph, fourth line. Our society's practice of justice is not concerned with creating just conditions, and our system of punishment does not penalize the powerful for crushing those with less power. The rich getting richer while others are ground under its part of the just order of our society. There are no solutions offered by the system, only the occasional display of suffering or civil death to satisfy the masses. Mm -hmm. Page 23. Second paragraph. Prison is simply a bad and ineffective way to address violence and crime. That's what a prison is. So, ineffective and bad methods to achieve a goal, what do you do with that? Do you say like, well, well you know, we got this bad method, let's try and make it better. Or do you say instead like, you know, let's figure out a different method. <laughs> This is what abolitionism is about. But we're on page 23, this is the last paragraph. The idea of predators and dangerous people is complicated by the conditions our society enforces. Social and economic conditions that we know generate crime and despair. That's the thing, we know that these things are happening. We just refuse to think about them and therefore have this superficial idea of, you know, Predators, good guys, bad guys, dangerous people, morally corrupt, evil doers, right? Um, but we know we should be thinking about these things more deeply. We just don't want to go there, right? Because then we're going to have to confront ourselves and our shortcomings, you know, as a society. Communities whose needs are met are not rife with crimes of desperation, whereas struggling communities are. And people from communities that are highly criminalized by our racist system are far more likely to be thrust into the carceral system. Politicians routinely feign ignorance with regard to these dynamics, presenting tough on crime agendas that would enhance prison sentences and widen the school to prison pipeline as a solution to the harms society generates. Because if politicians acknowledge that that most criminalized harms are rooted in social and economic inequalities, they will be expected to address those inequalities, which most refuse to do. Mm -hmm. And I put in my notes, most crime is motivated by social economics, not ethics. Okay, people, most crime is committed because of social economic conditions. Okay, not like moral judgment calls, right? Or ethical failings. I skip down nine lines. Of course, a system that never addresses the why behind a harm never actually contains the harm itself. Cages confine people, not the conditions that facilitated their harms or the mentalities that perpetuate violence. Now I go to page 25, this is the last paragraph. We live in a society that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. It's time to look hard at how this system came to be, who profits, how it functions, and why. And it's time to imagine what it would look like to see justice done without re relying on punishment and the bar barbarity of carceral systems. So let's do that. Let's ask ourselves, what, what is justice? Like, what really is justice? Are we, how do we go about achieving justice in our society? Does achieving justice require violence as punishment? Is that what's needed for justice to occur? Who, who, why is that a thing? Does justice require violence as punishment or pun, violent punishment? 
is violent punishment effective? <laughs> like, does it work to achieve, uh, to defeat crime, to achieve justice? Well, I'm going to go to here on page 44, and this is the second to last paragraph on that page. You can't force somebody into being accountable for things they do. That is not possible. People have to take accountability for things that they actually do wrong. They have to decide that this is wrong. They have to say, this is wrong and I want to be part of making some sort of amends or repairing this or not doing it again. The question is, what in our cu culture allows people to do that? What are the structural things that exist? What in our culture encourages people who assault people and harm people to take responsibility? What I see is almost nothing. That means, for example, people continue to be rewarded when they do bad things to other people or take ne negative action against people. I'm gonna skip a paragraph. We do have the threat that if you do admit that you do this, you might be caught up in the criminal punishment system. You might see the inside of a jail. So your inclination is to deny, deny, deny until the very end. There is just no incentive for you to come clean and be like, I actually did this. We are in this adversarial model where you don't admit it. And the person who is actually being placed on trial is the survivor to prove that you actually did this. Survivors have to take on the weight of actually figuring out how to bring somebody to accountability. The incentive structure is set up this way. Okay, so what is justice? It's about the justice involves a person who did the wrongdoing to admit that they did the wrongdoing and then to active, actively want to make amends, to be like, you know, I did this thing that was wrong. You know, I'm sorry, what can I do to address the wrong that I did, right? That's justice. Right? We, but our, our, our criminal justice system it has no mechanism for allowing that to happen. Instead, we force people into punishments that don't allow any type of an ability to right the wrong directly to the person that was wrong. Our, our current criminal justice system has, doesn't allow that to happen at all. Let me skip down four lines. We have to make violence unthinkable in our culture. We have to make interpersonal violence unthinkable. That is a place that we have to work from if we are really going to transform this into something where it isn't the survivors or the victims who have to carry the load all the time. Violence is unthinkable in our society. You might say to yourself, oh, that's, that's pretty naive. Like, you know, that's kind of like hippy dippy. Uh, that's not realistic, <laughs> all right, but you know, look at the history of the, you know, look at the past. Like people, there was a time when people was like, you know, we should end slavery. Slavery should no longer exist. And there, was, there's, there were people who were like, well, that's very unrealistic. Who's gonna do the labor, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, there's been many, you know, the people going to the moon, right? Well, that's very unrealistic. How the hell, how can we put, put somebody to the moon? Like that, get, get real, right? <laughs> There are many things that have been deemed unrealistic or unachievable that we have achieved because we put the, 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 we had the will as a human species to achieve these goals. That will just needs to be directed toward actually figuring out how do we deal with crime and justice. Okay, we're on page 46. This is the second paragraph. I start at the end of the second line. When we put people in prisons and in jails, Often we are sentencing them to judicial rape because we know they are going to be assaulted when they go inside. We know this, you know, there's so many TV shows that make have popularized this, this reality. Yet we are still putting people in that environment to be assaulted. How are you going to be an anti-rape advocate or organizer and still be pressing for people to be put into rape factories? Okay. How do you want to and violence and crime when you put people in conditions where they're faced with violence and crime. Like it's illogical, it makes no sense. Like it's not effective. <laughs> right? Now we're thinking about it 
we're critically thinking about the situation. Let me continue. We have to complicate this conversation around sexual violence and see all the different ways that it is used as a form of social control across the board with many different people from all different genders, all different races, and all different social locations. If we understand the problem in that way, we have a better shot at at actually uprooting all of the conditions that lead to this and addressing all of the ways in which sexual violence reinforces other forms of violence. Our work over a couple of decades now has been devoted to complicating narratives that are too easy. These really simple narratives around perfect victims who are assaulted by evil monsters and that is the end of the story. What is the author uh, talking about? here uh, when she's talking about our work she talked about the work of abolitionism they're looking at the the situation the reality with more complexity with more is they're looking at it more in depth they're using philosoph philosophical analysis and you know critical theory the quote kill all rapists end quote conversation which just kind of flattens what sexual violence really is that doesn't take into consideration the spectrum of sexual violence, minimizes certain people's experiences, and makes other people's experiences more valid. Okay, now I'm on page 47, second paragraph. I want more of those kinds of conversations to be happening in public, but somehow we can't have those. Well, we're, happen we're having that conversation right here in a public video. You can just look on the internet. Hello. We can't have complicated conversations about sexual violence because then you are accused of rape apologia or you are accused of coddling rapists. That is very, very limiting. It means that we are not going to be able to uproot and really solve the problem ultimately. We got to talk about the situation in depth to really solve the problem. Let me skip a paragraph. Important. That does not mean, however, there, there should be no consequences. It means real consequences. Consequences that really matter. It means transforming the conditions that exist in the first place. For this to even have happened, it is really critical for people to think about the difference between punishment and consequences. Okay? There's a difference. Okay? Punishment, consequences. One leads to ineffective results. The other leads to effective results. This is the last line of page 47. The prison industrial complex has churned communities and people through a meat grinder, devastating people. Yet people don't feel safer. People don't feel as though violence is curbed in any way. In many parts of the United States, crime is going up. An allocation of resources to police are increasing, but do people feel safer? Oh, wow, I'm, I'm so much safer because I see the, you know, the police with like military grade weaponry and equipment. I feel safe now. But no, you still see in the news crime is the issue. You know, violent, violent happenings are occurring. We have to build up the skills of being able to ask questions like, what does it mean to actually center a survivor who is harmed? What does it mean to actually support people who have caused harm? How are we going to create in our community spaces that allow people real opportunity to heal? How do we hold that people who have been harmed deserve an opportunity for that harm to be addressed in a real way? Mm -hmm. These are very deep questions and we need to find the answers to these questions to really start addressing the issue of crime and justice so again we're trying to define justice but what is justice in the sense of being effective right what is, what is real justice okay so kaba breaks down justice in two ways there's two types of justices <laughs> right. there's transformative justice and here I, I am on page 59 this is the third paragraph Transformative justice is a community process developed by anti-violence activists of color, in particular, who wanted to create responses to violence 
that do what criminal punishment systems fail to do. Build, support, and more safety for the person harmed, figure out how the broader context was set up for this harm to happen, and how that context can be, can be changed so that this harm is less likely to happen. It is time consuming and difficult work done by organizations. Okay, it's not like easy fixes. It's difficult, time consuming work. You know, it takes a lot of thought, a lot of effort, a lot of reimagination. It is not grounded in punitive justice. That's another type of justice, punitive justice, which is the abolitionists argue is ineffective. And it actually requires us to challenge our punitive impulses while prioritizing healing, repair, and accountability. That's important to note. You know, when you're harmed, you do have that initial instinct to like uh, punish in, in violent ways. You know, it's an impulse. We, we need to acknowledge that, but it's ineffective, right? We have many impulses and drives within us as, in, within us as human beings that we have to, you know, rein in, control, because we know like, okay, this is not really gonna achieve anything uh, useful in the long term. A truly transformative justice would immediately focus on addressing the harms penetrated centered on the con concerns and experiences of the person who was harmed. We would also focus on the person responsible for the harm, but without disregarding their humanity. This means we, we have to acknowledge the reality that often it is hurt people who hurt other people. Understanding that harm originates from situations dominated by stress, scarcity, and oppression. One way to prevent violence is to make sure that people have support to get the things they need. We must also create a culture that enables people to actually take accountability for violence and harm. The criminal punishment system promises accountability for violence, but we know that in actuality, it is a form of targeted violence against poor people, people with disabilities, and people of color, and doesn't reduce violence in our society. Real accountability calls us to respond to harm. That occurs because that person responsible was struggling with mental illness by providing high quality treatment. If violence emerged because of poverty and desperation, then creating survivable conditions might prevent future harm. If violence originated because of unexamined misogyny or sexism learned in a family or broader culture, a community process that invites a person responsible to examine that would be more likely to lead to a positive outcome than incarceration in a cell where the person is likely to experience more violence. Finally, in a truly transformative model of justice, we would not allow those harms to be shielded by powerful people or institutions, we would insist on focusing not just on individuals, but institutions and structures. That's how we gotta look at this. We gotta look at it as institutionally and structurally, not just individualistically, that perpetuate, foster, and maintain interpersonal violence. Now we're on page 62. This is the second line of the third paragraph. We're not simply talking about the need to dismantle a larger system. We're talking about a process of construction and creativity. Neutralizing perceived threats in an endless game of legal whack-a-mole is not a path to safety. Okay, last paragraph. When you say, what would we do without prisons? What you are really saying is, what would we do without civil death, exploitation, and state-sanctioned violence? That is an old question and the answer remains the same. Whatever it takes to build a society that does not continuously rearrange the trappings of annihilation and bondage while calling itself free. To know freedom or safety and to make peace with our own fears, passive punishments must be replaced with active amends and accountability. And I'm gonna go to that, the last paragraph of page 65. Turning away from systems of policing and punishment doesn't mean turning away from accountability. It just means we stop setting 
the value of a life by how much time another person does in a cage for violating or taking it, particularly when the criminal punishment system has consistently made clear whose lives it will value and whose lives it will cage. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about the, the situation critically, philosophically. We're not being naive or dismissive. We're actually saying to, asking ourselves, does the system we currently have really address the issue? And how was the system set up? Criminal justice, prisons, policing. Is the objective of that institution, that structure, <laughs> right? that enterprise, criminal justice, policing, prison, is the objective actually to stop crime, deliver justice, deliver safety? Is that really the objective of prisons and policing? Or is that like a front, right? What's really going on? And if it is a front, right? If that's not what they're really set up to do, it's just like what they say they do, right? But that's not really what they do. What is it that they really do? Right? Is it a method of social control? Right? Statistics show that that's what's happening. And so if it, if it is a method of social control, social economic control, is reforming or changing the current system actually going to deliver real justice? Right? Or is it going to really address crime? Or is it just going to be another method of social economic control? Let's return back to what is abolition? Uh, this is page 72, second paragraph. Abolition is a long-term project and a practice around creating the conditions that would allow for the dismantling of prisons, policing, and surveillance, and the creation of new institutions that actually work to keep us safe and are not fundamentally oppressive. What you need to make those conditions happen you have to be for addressing environmental issues. You have to be for making sure people have a living wage economically. I know for me, this is Kaba talking, but you know, totally agree with what she's saying. Um, I know for me, it's important to be anti-capitalist. And I know that's a boogie word, right? Oh, you know, blame capitalism for everything. Oh, she's a commie or whatever. Look, people commit crime and I'm reading my notes, primarily because they lack social economic resources. You know, we gotta stop thinking about all, oh, you know, the, the, these people who commit these horrible acts, there's something morally inept about them. Like, it is most likely the case, and you know, it's been shown through sociological studies and like statistical analysis that people who commit crime do it because they lack access to essential resources whether that's you know economic or social meaning like you know love and belonging <laughs> you know some sort of health care where it'd be like psychological mental health issues or quite frankly maybe they just don't understand how to operate in a loving relationship because they've been conditioned by their environment their whole life to operate in a, a way that's violent and addressing that issue is an anti-capitalist type of way of problem solving. Because capitalism is rooted in what? Exploitation. Exploitation is oftentimes what? Violent. So I continue on page 94. This is the fifth paragraph, second line. Somebody had to actually first imagine prisons and the police themselves in order to create them. Everything you see in the world, somebody thought of it first. Okay, so that's important to remember. Like, policing didn't always exist. Prisons didn't always exist. Right, because so people will ask, well, what do we do without prisons or police? Uh, well, <laughs> society has existed without either. Let's think about that. Once things are actually into the world and exist, you can't imagine how the world functioned before it. It's like we develop amnesia. You just assume things have always been as they are. I see this in myself. The other thing about prisons and police is how they make people, the vast majority of people, feel secure. 
I don't mean safe, I mean secure. Secure means that the scary, awful monsters people are kept at bay by those institutions. That is a story that gets told and reinforced by media, by our parents, by our, our culture. This is our story. The cops are in our heads and hearts. Therefore, this system is naturalized in a way that makes it almost impossible for folks to step back and think that it wasn't always like this. Security and safety, okay, is a distinction. That's another useful tool in philosophy. Philosophy is great for making distinctions. And oftentimes we don't do that, we get into trouble. But here, distinctions are being made, very important. So then we get to solving problems, right? The problem of crime the problem of delivering justice, okay? There's a difference between security and safety, okay? Security and safety aren't the same thing. Security is a function of the weaponized state that is using guns, weapons, fear, and other things to make us secure, right? Horrible things are supposed to be kept at bay by those tools. Even though we know that horrible things continue to happen all the time, guns is a good example of that, you know, we, we have guns, they make us feel secure, but do they actually create safety? No, <laughs> they don't. And that those very tools and the corresponding institutions are reproducing the violence and horror they are supposed to contain. All of these things are pretty clear to a whole bunch of people. We just, I think, don't want to have to think hard about what else might be possible. I think so too. That's why, I did, well, that's the point of this channel is to like think hard about very important things that we tend not to. And so we go into serious problems because we, were, we don't want to think hard about these things, but we should. Okay, so I'm gonna go to page 98. This is the last paragraph. Living the way we live makes it difficult for most people to seriously consider the end of policing. The idea that cops equal security is difficult to dislodge. To transform this mindset where cops equal security means we have to actually transform our relationships to each other enough so that we can see that we can keep each other safe. You cannot have safety without strong, empathetic relationships with, e with others. You can have security without relationships, but you cannot have safety. Actual safety without healthy relationships, without getting to really know your neighbor, figuring out when you should be intervening, when you hear and see things, feeling safe enough when within your community that you feel like, yeah, my neighbor's punching their partner. I'm going to knock on the door, right? I'm not going to think that the person is going to pull a gun on me and shoot me in the head. I don't believe that because I know that person. I know them. I built that relationship with them, and even though they're upset and mad, I'm taking the chance of going over there and being like, you need to stop this now. What are you doing? Part of what this necessitates is that we have to work with members of our community to make violence unacceptable. So we're, now we're getting at, getting at how do we deal with the issue. Well, it's about building relationships. It's about understanding our interconnectedness. This is about acknowledging community as a center of society. This is a problem of political organizing, not one of punishment. How can we organize to make interpersonal violence unthinkable? That necessitates transformation on so many levels for many people. But it doesn't necessitate it actually for some other groups who have never had the option of calling the police. They just haven't and they've been managing to take care of each other and themselves outside of that option. It's not impossible, right? There are communities that deal with this without the police. Listen, our question answers themselves if we look right in front of our nose. People ask me all the time what abolition looks like. You know there are groups of people who are living a type of abolition now. I want you to think of affluent white neighborhoods in the Chicago area like Naperville, where there are no cops to be found anywhere. You actually have to call them up, call them to show up. Their kids school, no cops, no metal detectors. They have what they need. The people are working. Talk about full employment. People have houses 
that are worth millions. They've got housing, healthcare, jobs, all the things to make it so people won't feel we need police prisons and surveillance. There are some communities already living that today. Okay. Right, right. Affluency <laughs> is a social economic issue. The question is why for them and not for us? I think to some degree, imagination is necessary, yes, but we don't have to imagine that far into the future. It's here. Right. This is what we're talking about, about like what, what our police and prison really are. Are they like forms of, of delivering safety? Solving crime? No, the, the social economic control mechanisms, <laughs> right? Because some people are already living the abolitionist dream and some people are not. Why them and not us? Mm -hmm. Philosophy, critical analysis. We have to stop making things so complicated and seeming so fantastic around abolition. Oh my gosh, abolition doesn't make sense. How would we, how would we even do that? I'm like, you're doing it right now. Certain people's race and status protect them. And that protection needs to be possible for everybody. You're just telling it like it is. You know, you might not want to hear it, <laughs> right? But it is, you know. The solutions are there, right? It's more about confronting the solutions, right? And thinking about the solutions. Being brave enough to seriously work through that problem that is society now. This is page 134. It's the last um, line. The criminal legal system focuses on punishing or disempowering individual offenders who have done harm. Prison industrial complex abolitionists, however, consider the larger social, economic, and political context in, in which the harm occurs. Skip, I skip a paragraph. Having determined a need for accountability, we must consider a range of alternatives for redress. Sometimes we demand concrete restitution that supports survivor and community healing. Other times we insist on counseling and other interventions that can produce changes in behavior. We also can't discuss alternative ways of addressing harm in a vacuum. We have to ask how the current system evaluates and educates harms. Okay, now I'm gonna read page 137. If you don't believe that it's appropriate to lock human beings in cages, then you must think nothing should happen to people who harm others, claims the detractors. Okay, people who don't think abolitionism is a, you know, a thing that we should even pursue, the detractors. And this is the very heart of the problem. It's prison or nothing. Okay, that's the problem. You know, if we we have to have prisons, because if we don't, I don't want to even think about what happens if we don't. Right? That's the problem. We need to think about it, okay, seriously, like not just like take a few minutes, like no. While abolitionists hold a range of values, principles, and ideas about transformation, we've never known an abolitionist who thought that nothing was preferred was the preferred alternative to imprisonment. We believe in consequences for harm. Those consequences may involve foregoing royalties and any future financial gain derived from the context in which the harm occurred, or being required to pay restitution or, or provide labor to those who have been harmed. Those consequences might include restricted access to specific groups or spaces or ineligibility for positions of leadership. Consequences might also include being required to make a public apology. Regardless of what's chosen, the point is that any consequences should be determined in direct relationship to the harm done and should involve input by people impacted by the harm. The idea that until abolitionist approaches can meet people's idealized version of an appropriate response, prison is the best solution is at best a failure of imagination and a manifestation of blinkered thinking. It suggests that prison industrial complex abolition is some fixed horizon at which we will arrive without having to put in any effort. The conditions in which abolitionist approaches will flourish 
won't magically appear. They must be fought for and nurtured and defended. For those conditions to exist, we need to put in the steady work of eliminating the use of surveillance, policing, sentencing, and imprisonment. For those con conditions to exist, we need to practice operating without using those systems and institutions. For those conditions to exist, we must create them. Acceding to, as some do to prison in the meantime only prevents them from taking root. Okay, and I'm going to go on page 139. This is a 12th line. Understand how deeply enmeshed we are in the very systems that we're organizing to transform. They are systems that live within us, that manifest outside of us. If we don't really take that seriously, I don't think we're going to make a dent in this problem. <laughs> that's interesting because, I mean, that's a reality that, you know, the brightest minds have come to. Um, societal systems live within us and they manifest outside of us at the same time. You know, I just did a video about Hegel, <laughs> famous philosopher. He says the same thing, <laughs> right? Uh, and when we think about prisons and policing, we're not like coming to terms with that reality, that philosophical reality. But, but abolitionists are. They are like taking that into serious consideration and saying like, look, prisons and policing they don't take into account like implementing those institutions as methods of addressing crime and delivering justice. They're not taking into consideration that systems live within us and they manifest outside of us. <laughs> That's a contradiction that we need to reckon with. But let me continue. It's not a story of individual monsters, right? Oh, that, 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 that horrible person, right? That serial killer, that like horrendous rapist, that pedophile, right? It's not a story of that. We have to, we have got to think about this in a more complex way. You know, the society, that that the, that pedophile, that um, serial killer, that you know, fill in the blank, whoever evil doer you want. What in what in the society enabled or fostered that person to commit those evil acts? That's how we really address the problem of crime and the issue of delivering true justice. Okay, now we're on page 141. This is the, this is the fourth line of the second paragraph. You can never actually make anybody accountable. Okay, we said that. Look, it's, it's noteworthy to repeat. People have to be accountable. A lot of the frustration that I hear from people who think about transformative justice or community accountability is really people who want to punish people. I totally understand that they want punishment. It's a normal human reaction within our society that is so incredibly punitive. How do we live outside that? Remember again, the systems live within us. The punishment mindset is very hard to get out of. So how do we live outside of that, that normal human reaction of you know punishment violent punishment to address harm we got to understand the nature of it right the nature of it to get outside of it okay i'm going to page 146 um, the end of the first line no one enters violence for the first time by committing it all this shit that we talk about these binaries about victims and perpetuators that explodes it all. At heart, it's the harm that exists that has motivated and transformed us and allowed us to continue. And if we're not intervened with, we'll keep harming bigger people in bigger and bigger ways. When we know we're all going to harm each other, it's a matter of degrees. Punishment does not work, right? Violence is a cycle. I, I would even go further and say, you know, evil. <laughs> Evilness is a cycle, right? To break away from that cycle is to get away, to break away from the punitive reaction. Addressing violence with violence just keeps you in that cycle and doesn't solve anything, right? Because you're, you're just stuck. Uh, this is why abolitionists argue you, you, 
we got to get out of the, the cycle of violence because it's just going to keep us harming each other. This is the fourth paragraph, the fifth line. I want that internal resource that allows you to take responsibility for harms that you commit against yourself and other people. I want that to be a central part of how we interact with each other. Because while I don't believe in punishment, I believe in consequences for actions that are done to harm other people. So Kaba uh, is saying that there is an internal resource that does allow us to take responsibility for our, our actions and want us to right our wrongs. That, that is within us, but our current societal structure does not allow that internal resource to manifest. All right, we're just stuck in this punitive cycle. It, you know, it, the, our, our society feeds into that instinct. And, but, the, but the other instinct to be like, no, I wanna actually right the wrong. That, that, is, that does exist in us. But our society just crushes that because we're we are uh, stuck in this this these systems of punitive justice, which is policing in prison. But let me continue. I skip down the line. With punishment at the center of everything, we haven't been able to really address the other stuff that needs to happen. They need to take accountability when they harm people. We gotta allow that to happen, right? Accountability can't be forced, right? It has, to, it has to be a free choice, right? For it to be real or to be meaningful. Well, uh, but we're just too busy punishing people in violent ways, then there really is no true accountability, right? There's just like, well, I'm gonna inflict violence on you, which then just leads to more violence. And that, so that doesn't end crime, right? That doesn't deliver safety. Let me read you this uh, quote from page 158. It's the fifth line of the second paragraph. Everyone makes mistakes and that we all deserve a chance to be held accountable for them so that we can do and be better next time. So it's not this hippy dippy, uh, new age, <laughs> like uh, fairy tale type of response. It, you know, everybody makes mistakes, yes, but you know, the author isn't saying, uh, oh, so, you know, we just need to be forgiven. She's saying much more than that. She's saying, like, we need the opportunity when we make a mistake to be held accountable, like truly accountable, right? not just be put locked up in a cage, you know, where, you know, if you go to prison, right, and you are uh, sentenced and you, you know, you can say, oh, I, I plead not guilty. I don't, I didn't do this. Well, you're going to face 30 years in jail. Okay, lock me up. I didn't, I didn't do this. Like, you're not admitting accountability. You're just being punished. And you're also not given the opportunity to directly address the harm that you committed. We all must make mistakes in various degrees, right? And this is what she's talking about. And that's very realistic. That's not, that's not like naive. Justice should be implemented in our society in this way, right? That enables true accountability. Uh, so let me end on this quote on page 177. This is the last paragraph. You have a responsibility to live in this world. Your responsibility is not just to yourself. You are, you are connected to every one. I skip down to the second paragraph. You are interconnected to everyone because the world doesn't work without everyone. You may think that you're alone, but you're never actually alone. The importance of collectivity. We can't do anything alone that, that's worth it. Everything that is worthwhile is done with other people. Okay, that's very important. It is the theme of the Black Ponder this YouTube channel. What is, you know, what, what, you know, when you talk about like the meaning of life, not, you know, we're getting really heavy here philosophically. Uh, one of the realities that I think humans have to come to terms with that we're not even close to coming to terms with is our interconnectivity. You know, we're all connected to each other. But, and the, the reason, and since we don't acknowledge that, a lot of us don't, uh, we're, trapped in these cycles of violence and turmoil and oppression and uh, 
we can't advance <laughs> as a species and you know part of the problem is manifested in crime right uh, and our inability to deliver actual justice uh, to be able to deliver justice and to address crime in a meaningful way we have to acknowledge our interconnectedness with each other like that we see a horrendous act that somebody did uh, it's not just oh you know that indiv individual was horrible and they did something wrong because they something about their mind was you know messed up thinking about it like that does nothing to address the issue like to, to meaningfully provide uh, a healing right to to right the wrong in like any kind of meaningful way instead we should view like acts of violence or wrongdoing as wh in what way am I involved in that action and how do you do that because <laughs> you might say well I'm so far removed from that I'm not related in in that situation in any way but you are uh, because once you start thinking about reality as a, as societal as uh, a system like you know if you start looking at your existence as part of the operation that is humanity and you start thinking about okay what am i doing that's contributing to society and and then and then how does my contribution uh, enable society to create that kind of evil that then fosters people to do those type of things you know those horrendous acts of murder violence uh, that kind of wrongdoing. That's how we need to look at the the, the world, right, and uh, society, and like, you know, wrongdoing. And abolitionism looks at the world in that way. Abolitionists say, look, police and prison, they're doing nothing really to deliver justice, to address the issue of crime, right? In in many ways, they're just perpetuating it, right? What are the actual mechanisms tools or resources that we need to truly like end crime in our society to you know when somebody makes a mistake and they hurt people how can we enable people who make those mistakes to be accountable for those mistakes and then uh, take responsibility for those mistakes you know from of their own free will and choice and that's what abolitionism is. It's not this surface level type of thinking of, oh, abolition, uh, abolitionists, they just want to like get rid of police and prisons and then they think like it's going to be some utopian uh, heaven on earth garden to eat in society. No, <laughs> it's, not, it's much more deeper than that. It's much more uh, critically thought out than that. And, you know, this is just one of, of, of many works, right? Mariam Kaba has been doing abolitionist work for decades, right? It's a, a movement that has been going on for a long time and she's just one of many, right? But of course, you know, mainstream society and media wants to like not publicize, you know, highlight, uh, showcase that kind of work. Mainstream pop culture has a superficial, very elementary understanding of the philosophy of abolition work or ab the abolition movement, but it's very deep. I encourage you this is a great starting point like this is a great entry point if you're want to learn more uh, about abolition as a movement a modern day contemporary movement and you're really trying to understand like what is this really all about this uh, like defund the police uh, ab abolish prisons abolish police what is this really all about check it out this is a great entry point and there's many many other texts that you can consult after this so check it out. We do this till we free us. Well, this is the Black Ponderer. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.